the Brown Pundits Browncast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Brown Pundits Browncast. This is the 12th episode in our series of podcasts on the history of the Indian subcontinent. In this episode, I am joined by Mukunda Raghavan and Jay Vardhan Singh to talk about the social and cultural milieu of North India from 700 AD to about 1200 AD. In the 11th episode of the podcast series, we had covered the political history of North India for this period. My name is Manish Taneja, and I welcome you all to this episode. Hi, guys. Hi, Mukunda. Hi, Jay. Hey. Hi, Manish. Hi, Manish. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. So let's get started. Uh, Jay, first to you. Uh, what's, the, what's the religious landscape like in North India when at the beginning of the 8th century? Uh, what percentage of population do we have any idea? What percentage of the population is Hindu? Uh, how influential is Buddhism? How far spread out is Jainism? What's the religious landscape like? Uh, I think uh, when we look at the religious landscape of uh, this period, so this period is generally in the uh, historical discourse is called the early medieval period. So the general picture which we get is a de- uh, is the picture of decline of Buddhism. So Buddhism earlier, when we uh, look at the period of Gupta period and even in the earlier modern period, Buddhism was uh, one of the popular religions of uh, the the landscape. But now what we are seeing that uh, it, the Buddhism as a religion is restricted to some particular regions. So for example, like uh, if we start with uh, Kashmir. So from Kashmir was an important center of Buddhism. For example, uh, there is this, uh, we are told that uh, there was once a great council that happened in Kashmir. So, but by the time of 8th century AD, what we see is that uh, the Kashmir, in Kashmir particularly, Buddhism is in a decline. And we have, uh, for example, Huen Sang, who, uh, who, uh, who traveled in India during the reign of Harshvardhan. So he writes that the the king of Kashmir uh, is favorable to Buddhism, but the general population uh, is, uh, he uses the term, or or, or the translation uses the term heretics. So he writes that the general uh, population uh, is given to the heretics. So uh, this is the picture, but the picture actually, which we get from Kashmir is a complex one. For example, if we uh, look at Raj Tarangani, so Kalhan, uh, tells uh, gives numerous reference of uh, the images of Buddha, and uh, when we read Raj Tarangani, there is this uh, there is this sense which we get that there is this great familiarity with the Buddhist tradition as a whole. And uh, what uh, we see is that earlier we can say that majority of the elites used to patronize Buddhism, but by the time of eighth century or seventh century AD, the patronizing is. Uh, uh, what you can say is uh, equally uh, given to these two traditions. And uh, there's this important text uh, uh, that uh, comes from Kashmir is called Neelamat Quran. And Neelamat Quran is, is our oldest source of Hindu practices in Kashmir. And in this text, uh, there is this important, I think, uh, when we talk about uh, the relation between Buddhism and uh, Hinduism in Kashmir particularly. So here we are told that uh, uh, Buddha's birthday should be practiced as a great festival. So uh, like we uh, think of today as Buddhism being a somewhat of a a distinct religion from Hinduism or there's this separateness between these two traditions. But here uh, a a text which we call a a Hindu text tells us a completely different, uh, uh, different picture. So Broadly in Kashmir, what we see is that there is this ascendancy of uh, Hindu, uh, some scholars have used the term Brahmanical revival. And uh, for example, scholars like Andre Wink has this argument that it is from the Kashmir region that the uh, revival of the Brahmanical tradition began. So this is what we see in Kashmir. And when we... Jay, if I can just add something to this, is that that okay? Okay, so I, I also think... So in this period, we and this is roughly around the seventh century, right, or or seven hundred, seven hundred to eight hundred time time frame. This is also the time period in Kashmir. I think we have to be understanding. This is the the age of Tantra, right? This is the the really where Tantra really starts taking off 
um, strongly. Although the tantric roots go back well, probably to the Vedic time period. Um, you know, a lot of the the, the tantras have connections to the Taitreya, um, uh, the, the, the Taitreya um, um, uh, shaka of the uh, Krishna Yajurveda. Uh, and uh, some even uh, uh, pull into Madhyanya and then also uh, um, other shakas of, uh, of the various Vedas. So there's connections that go back pretty far. But during this time period, roughly, you know, you could say 700, 800 CE onwards, um, you see a, a explosion of sorts in, in tantric literature, um, especially in Kashmir, um, in the schools of like Trika, um, uh, Shakta Shaivism, um, even Vaishnavism, um, and, and and particularly interesting is Buddhism. Also, in this time, has a starts developing a lot of tantric uh, undertones, especially uh, the uh, the Madhyamika tradition. Uh, you know, through things like Vajrayana and so on, and they become they kind of are having a dialogue with each other. Or they're, some of them are copying from each other. Some of them are uh, innovating, but. It does strike me as interesting that when people say this is the revival of the Brahminical uh, 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 religion, when in fact Tantra, for a large part, isn't Brahminical, right? Like the many of the Vedic mantras, um, the Vedic practices are recouched in Tantra. Um, so, for example, there there be a Vedic Gayatri mantra, and then there's a Tantra Gayatri mantra, and in Tantra, for a large part, you know, various Tantras indicate that well certain communities historically did not have the Yagnopavitam for the Vedic side. Many of them had Yagnopavitam or uh, for, or, you know, the Janoi for the Tantra side. So it's a very interesting complex moment in time where you start to see the development of, of Tantra in relationship to what you would call Vedic uh, or Brahminical uh, uh, positions, and and on your point on on also Buddhism, like it's it's very interesting because from the origin of Buddhism, you know, in the fifth sixth century BCE till probably you know I would say like 12th, 13th, 14th century CE, Buddhists and Hindus for a large part were um, interchangeable, right? You know, you would have a Buddhist, you know, I've said this before, you know, the, the texts talk about you know. Uh, Brahmanas and Kshatriyas doing, you know, Vedic practices at home, whether it's a yajna or whatever, and then going out to a lecture by Buddha or, um, you know, the sangha and and giving giving to the sangha and being part of the sangha. So it's it's it's, it's a very complex uh, social environment at that time. And is that complexity only in and around Kashmir, or is it now spreading out across uh, the plains to the west to east? No, it's been like that for I, you know, from my understanding, and Jay can maybe correct me, is it's been like that for centuries across all of India, right? Like even for example, I mean, we we're, this episode's really focused on North India, but even in South India, you have you know uh, Silapadi Haram, which is a kind of a, a merger between Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, written by one one person that all had all these different uh, perspectives, and I think that that's basically what was going on even in the north at that time. Uh, yes, uh, because if you look at Sindh, for example, so Sindh, there's this general belief that when uh, uh, before the Arab invasion, uh, the population of Sindh was majority Buddhist. And uh, actually, we have no uh, proof to actually say this uh, concretely because the problem with the source, for example, particularly Sindh, is that we only rely on the Arabic sources. And Arabic sources have this term of uh, that we that they use is the term Bud. Now, Bud, interestingly, uh, the Arabic sources or the Arabic authors are themselves confused because sometimes, for example, uh, with the famous Multan uh, temple, the temple, the Sun Temple of Multan. So some have used that uh, it was a Bud temple. So because of this, there is this uh, confusion within the general scholarship of Sindh. Uh, so we are exactly not sure how prominent Buddhism was, although it was a prominent legion, but the degree of its prominence is varied. So, but there is this general belief, for example, who in Sang, like most of the Buddhism part, particularly if you look at the historical uh, view, 
Huen Sang Wars uh, works provide us a general overview of this period, particularly the start of this period. So Huen Sang tells us that in uh, in in Sindh there are around four sixty Buddhist monasteries and there are some twenty six thousand monks, and the uh, uh, the uh, the Buddhist tradition that was practiced in Sindh was somewhat of a different tradition compared to, uh, let's say, the, uh, the the Eastern Buddhist tradition. For example, when we move to Eastern India and the region of Bihar and Bengal, which was during this period ruled by the Pala. So here we are told, uh, uh, we, here we see that like what Mukunda has uh, talked about, about the uh, Tantra tradition. So in the Pala territory, it is the Tantra tradition that is dominant. And uh, the interesting uh, thing about Tantra, for example, the Vikram Shila University, we all know about the Vikram Shila uh, Mahavidyale or Mahavihara. So uh, Vikram Shila was an important center of Tantra, uh, Tantra tradition. And it is from the Pala region, what we see is that the Buddhist scholars of Tantra, uh, they, uh, you know, are going to, uh, let's say the Tibbat, uh, uh, because Tibbat uh, eventually becomes an important center of Tantra Buddhism. So Tantra, the spread of Tantra uh, or the popularity of Tantra in uh, in Tibbat was mainly due to the Palas. But here again, like what Mukunda talked about, what we see is that although the Palas uh, patronized the Buddhist, but that does not mean that there was no patronization to, let's say, the uh, Puranic or uh, Hindu religion, as a, if, if we want to call it. So what we see is that like they patronized uh, uh, the Shaiva traditions as well. And, uh, and uh, when we talk about the Jainis, uh, Jains, what we see is that basically during this period, they are confined to the Western India and some parts of Southern India, basically the region of Karnataka or Mysore region, or even in Northern Karnataka as a whole. So Jainism, like what we today uh, think of Jainism, strong strongholds of Jainism or the regions where Jainism is popular. So this, uh, this dates back to this period. So I think I will stop now. So what we are saying is that this is a period at which both Buddhism and Buddhism is sort of receding from uh, the plains and north and west of India and East India and Jainism sort of uh, more centered towards the Deccan and the area which is now northern Karnataka, Maharashtra and Gujarat, that part of the country, is it? Yes, uh, and par parts of Rajasthan also. And we are also... Yeah, go ahead, and Manish. we are also seeing we we are also seeing emergence of the tantra tradition. Yeah, and and I would say also this is Jainism. This is the, you know, what we would call, uh, quote unquote, golden age of Jainism too, right? You have, you know, during this period of time, the development of Jaina, um, quote unquote, itihasas, um, you know, where they kind of take a lot of. Mahabharata, Ramayana, um, uh, all those uh, itihasas in, in the in the Hindu side, and they re recouch them in in the Jain world, right? You you I think uh, they're they call I think it's, there's one called Padma Purana, which is the Jaina version of the Mahabharata. With uh, they develop the the ideas of Vasudeva, Prati Vasudeva, um, and it it becomes a much more it starts growing in size in that period. I actually, uh, I mean, although people disagree with me on this, I, I do think during this time period, you do see kind of a growth of Jainism um, across uh, across India. And, and North India, I, I think it, it was still there, but I think it moved probably from its origin point in the East in, um, you know, uh, in Mithila area and, uh, you know, uh, Bihar in that region and moved towards both the, the west towards uh, Gujarat and then it moved south into Maharashtra, um, you know, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Right. We've joined, we've been joined by Omar Saab. Hello, Omar Saab. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I just joined late. Uh, you can go ahead. I'll I'll jump in whenever I can. Uh, right. I'll just so, join in. So I'm not sure what you guys are wanting. Pranam, Omar Saab. So long. It's been so long since we spoke. 
good to, good to hear your voice. Thank you. So we just started and you were just looking at, uh, since we are talking the social cultural milieu of North India from 700 AD to 1200 AD, we just started on uh, discussing uh, what was the religious landscape, landscape like, what was the influence right. of Buddhism, Jainism and Hinduism. Right. Uh, uh, moving on, Mukunda and Jay. So what are the major festivals that are celebrated? Which are the festivals that are getting state patronage? And uh, what's that landscape like? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because I think all the festivals we have now were still celebrated then under different names. Um, and it depends on the region again, too. Uh, you know, Raksha Bandhan, which just happened, uh, was still celebrated there. You, you see it come up, I believe it might be Vishnu Purana, but oh, maybe I'm wrong. It's maybe not Vishnu Purana. Um, I forget which Purana it is. It comes, it comes up in that Purana. And oh, and just on the side note, uh, according to many of the of the current scholars that that look at the dating of of text, um, a large corpus of the Puranas at at this time in this time period is when they were finalized at some level to what we have today. So, for example, like Devi Bhagavatam, Skanda Purana. Agni Purana, even though the, uh, Vishnu Purana, even though these texts go back, you know, maybe some of them go back into the first uh, first half of the uh, of the last millennia, the BC period. Um, some maybe even older, but they are formalized in this time period. Which, in some sense, I do think that it, it, if that's the case, they were capturing many of the festivals that were occurring, with, whether it's uh, you know Diwali or Diwali or Holi, um, you know, all these all these all these festivals um, were practiced in that time, along with uh, what's known as, uh, I think it's called Indra Jocha. You know, the, um, they had a festival celebrating Indra also in that time period, which I think was connected to what we have today in Raksha Bandha. Right. Jay, what do we know about this period? Was Holi celebrated? Was it a big festival? What about more prominent festivals and more popular festivals like Dipavali and Dashera? Do we have any historical uh, records of kings celebrating them and patronizing them? Uh, as far as I know, uh, Holi as a uh, traditional festival of the arrival of spring was uh, celebrated from, I think, uh, much before this period. But uh, whether it is called, it was called Holi back then is, I'm not very sure about that. And uh, about the question of uh, Dashera and uh, uh, and uh, Diwali. So, although this uh, this most likely will date uh, dates back to uh, the period of like fourteenth uh, or sixteenth century, but I do think that uh, some of the festival, particularly the Shara, for example, uh, became associated with a particular, let's say, uh, Varna. So, and this association mainly happened during this period. That's what I believe. For example, so uh, for Dashera, if we talk about Vijay Dashmi, as it is called. So Vijay Dashmi was generally believed to be associated with the Kshatriya tradition. And there's this, uh, even uh, in the later period, for example, the Marathas, the Marathas had this uh, notion of Simo Langan. So during this period, it was believed that the, in Dashera, it was the duty of a particular king to cross his, his territory and uh, uh, begin the period of expedition. So uh, Dashara as a important tradition uh, festival in the Kshatriya tradition, I, I believe that it has roots uh, during this period. So as a so because it is generally it is also the period when in uh, India the campaign season starts. So Dashara was the time when uh, the crops are you know uh, are in plenty so this is the time when uh, army uh, armies used to march so as a tradition of kshatriyas uh, this uh, festival of the shara i think uh, dates back to this period or even there are uh, there could be the fact that this was a older tradition but i think the prominence of the shara as a kshatriya festival happened during this period Right. Right. And do we have any evidence of another very popular festival in North India now, the Krishna Janamashtami festival? Do we know anything about uh, 
its origins was it popular at this time of the uh, in this period jay oh uh, i'm not so sure about krishna jadmasthi jay you there am i audible yes you are audible do we know anything about the origins of the krishna janmashtami festival one of the more prominent north indian festivals was it popular uh, in this time i uh, if uh, i am not so sure about the if there are any reference to the fact that uh, uh, krishna janmashtami being celebrated although it is generally the region of around uh, mathura mathura was the center of vaishnavism or vasudev worship for example uh, for let's say the uh, the early modern period so it 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 uh, is generally believed that janmashtami would have been celebrated during this period because as mukunda has just said that uh, most of the puranas uh, because our ritualistic world view or our ritualistic tradition are basically derived from the puranas so most of the puranas were written during this period so i think uh, although i am not uh, aware of any uh, historical reference of jain janmashtami being celebrated but uh, the fact that puranas were compiled during this period suggest that janmashtami could have been celebrated during this period as a important festival occasion and uh, the vajrayan tradition for example uh, uh, also has this uh, there were basically uh, the tradition of uh, mahabalis so uh, uh, tarnath who is a tibetan scholar who uh, who writes in the 17th century but he talks about this period also so he writes that there was this although it is not related to festivals but uh, uh, he tells us that there was this mahabali that happened in vikramshila or he he describes it a human sacrifice so i think uh, it is although it is not uh, it is not related to festivals but there was this also the tradition of human sacrifice although it is tarnath who is writing in 17th century so we should take this as a uh, with a pinch of salt but i think uh, i just think I, it is an interesting uh, point so i mentioned that yeah i mean i'm of the opinion that many of these uh these bur- janmashtamis whether it's uh, you know ramanomi or krishna janmashtami you know um they are all they were celebrated i think as far as back as you know i think we can think about just because the texts are very particular about recording the you know the 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 nakshatra the tithi the vara all those astrological significance like for example krishna was born on ashtami in the rohini nakshatra you know and it tells you at what time so you can do the calculations to find out what date is in every year and and my guess is you know that that was celebrated um especially when you start thinking about even during this time period right you also have not only in south india there were temples in the north right and there are many temples in the north and these temples would all follow um you know tantra agama traditions and those traditions tend to uh really celebrate these uh birthdays or the shubhatitas you know uh, you know you know the, you know the the good days of um within captured in the in the various shastras so yeah i, I would say that in my perspective um you know i can't remember from the top of my head but i, I imagine if i spend some time in if i go into the panchratha text or something um there would there should be some uh, mentions of uh, uh krishna janmashtami especially since the panchratha tradition revolves around the the you know the satapatas or the or the four um uh vyuhas which is krishna or vasudeva pradyumna uh, aniruddha samkarshana but yeah but uh, i'm sure all these traditions have that right mukunda you mentioned a festival called indradhvaja festival what do we know about it what was it about how was it celebrated uh any, yeah i mean that? so uh, 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 jay do you have anything on indradhvaja festival no not really yeah um it it pops up in couple texts and i have to 
think it's called uh Intertucha. Maybe not. Or, or yeah, I, I could be mistaken. Honestly, like it's uh no, I don't there I is a one of the of episodes uh, right. Right, because we I remember in one of the early episodes we had also talked about the Indra festival. Fine. Uh, so what are uh, the what are the philosophers of this age talking about? Who are the prominent philosophers? What are they talking about? How's that strong how is how are the various strands of philosophy evolving in North India in this time? Yeah, uh, so this is actually um in many ways, again, it 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 does happen to be this time period of this enormous uh, growth of intellectual outpouring, um, textual outpouring, religious outpouring, um, scientific, uh, so much was going on in, across India at this time period. And in North India, this was, this was really, really uh, a, a, a vibrant environment, right? So you have, you know, the the development in this time of, for example, the both the Nyaya system, the Mamamsa system, at this point, maybe roughly a little before this, the Visheshika system kind of was absorbed under Nyaya. Um, and then you had uh, the development of, you know, as we saw earlier, is Vedanta becomes much stronger, but even though the core Vedanta texts were written probably uh, b- well before this time period. Um, and then you also have uh, the growth of Buddhist thinkers, whether it's like, you know, um, you know, uh, Dignaga, who you know, who was right before this time period, or, you know, um, there's, there's a few bunch of them, um, I have to think of it, like, uh, 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 you know, in the Kashmir tradition, you definitely have, like, Abhinavagupta, Shemaraja, uh, Udhayana, um, and then you have skeptics like Jairashi, who was a very, very strong, um, I mean, he's, he was a Charvaka school, he was an atheist, he was very strong skeptic, you had the development of the Mimamsa tradition through two major schools at this time. One was uh, Kumara Labatta, and the next one was Prabhakara. Um, and I don't want to get into too depth uh, into to do too deep as to what their differences were, but this was really just the the way you approach linguistics um, in relationship to the Vedic texts, right? Like what? How do you how do you understand the Vedic text? What are the Vedic injunctions saying? Um, what do the words mean? Like both these traditions are, you know, uh, of Kumara and Prabhakara uh, are are kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say they're atheistic. They just don't give much care about the concept of Ishwara. Um, and in re- response to that, you have the Nyaya tradition who developed very, very elaborate um, logical arguments for the, for the, existence of God, right? Um, some of them very much in in, in, in the same um, line of, uh, you know, uh, theological, logical arguments made by, you know, Aquinas or uh, the, the you, know, you know, the peripatet- peripatetics of uh, Islamic thought and so on and so forth. So in this time is, is really vibrant um, intellectual growth. I mean, if you want to talk about some of these people, we can, I mean, uh, if that's something that's interesting. Sure, let's do that. So let's start with the most prominent philosopher in North India in this period. Tell us about what's his uh, name. I mean, that's a tough. This. That's a tough one, right? It, most prominent. So pick your favorite one. Pick your favorite philosopher of this era. Okay, so one of my favorites in this time period would have to be um, uh, Jayanta Bhatta. Um, so he was a, a Nyaya philosopher. I think around like 850, something like that. I forget the exact date, uh, CE. So he was actually very interesting because he was a very strong uh, Nyayaka, which means they really focused on the Nyaya Sutras of Gautama, uh, um, which was written probably first century CE, if not a little before that. Um, and this and, and Nyaya Sutras really get into the epistemology of, of, of generally Indian thought, right? You know, what are the valid ways of knowing um, and how do you understand error? How do you understand, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, conceptual errors along with uh, um, uh, uh, things of uh, uh, ontology, right? So, for example, um, uh, the epistemological uh, tools that they talk about are usually, um, you know, there's uh, pratyaksha, which is just um, um, direct sense perception through your five senses. Um, there's uh, there's anumana, which is your inference. There's uh, 
There's um, Shabda, which is basically, um, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, text, uh, textual sources. There's memory. There is comparison. There's analogy. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of like seven or eight different uh, mm. ep ep epistemological, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, methods of knowing. Um, and Jayanta and his uh, uh, text uh, called Jnana Manjari um, really gets into the heart of addressing a lot of these epistemological concerns. And it gets a little deeper and it's very fascinating. Um, but more importantly, Jayanta was really, really awesome because he wrote one of the greatest, I think, one of the greatest um, satire slash um, works of literature in Indian Indian thought was this uh, text called Agama Dhambara, right? So he's, uh, Jayanta was a Kashmiri um, uh, philosopher and writer. Uh, he wrote this text called Agama Dhambara, which means the sort of uh, the, I mean, someone calls it, the much to do about religion is how they do it. But Agama, you know, is a text and Dambara is kind of like, uh, uh, I wouldn't say conflict, but kind of like a, a confusion, right? Uh, so um, this text is really about how each of the schools in Indian thought at that time, which is brilliant, because he does reference various schools that lived around that ninth century CE and basically how one his uh, main character, I believe his name was uh, Sankarshana, um, is like this orthodox Vedic student who is totally against Buddhists and Jains and all heterodoxy. But then in the course of like the entire uh, story, he comes to recognize that the king and the state should not be oppressing or suppressing any other traditions because it's a, it doesn't allow the the inquisitional sambada that occurs and, and he kind of the, the entire play um, ends with this really great speech about the importance of of, of pluralism of tolerance of 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 connection, relationships, and compromise. And it's a beautiful, beautiful text. Um, so if you get the chance, people should read that. So I think uh, Jayanta Bhatta is one of my favorite uh, uh, thinkers of that time. Um, and then and, and then there's within the Kashmir tradition, there's the the you know the the giant among all giants, Abhidhabhagupta, right? Who was quite possibly one of the greatest polymaths um, in Indian in the Indian history, right? He he was he was a philosopher. Um, he, you know, he wrote, uh, you know, the in, in, in the Shiva Sutras, um, and he had, uh, um, let's see, uh, what um, let me think about this for a sec. He also wrote amazing commentary on uh, of Natya Shastra, right? So it's called Abhinava Bharati. Um, if you get a chance, it, it, he really. So what he takes. So we talk now today about Navarasas, but what. What uh, Abhinava Gupta did is he took the Navarasa and he created a, a final rasa, um, which which is now so ubiquitous all throughout India that people don't even know that he created it. It's called Shantarasa, right? So before um, before Abhinava Gupta, Shantarasa wasn't part of the uh, the, the Natya Shastra, and then when Abhinava Gupta did his commentary, he 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 brought that out, and he uh, you know he it was a beautiful commentary where he. He goes into depth about the nature of of drama, performance, of music. Um, it is a magnum opus. Um, he has his other works of of basically Kashmiri Shaivism, which is you know uh, uh, Tantra Loka and uh, I think Tantra Rasa is the other one. Um, and then on top of that, he has uh, uh, his most famous. What he's known for is uh, the philosophy is. It's called Paradvaita, but it's also since um, the text is called Prati Abhignya uh, Vimarsha, right? So or Prati Abhignya Vimarshani is the text. And that really gets into the school of Kashmir Shaivism. Um, and that school really is about the nature of Jagat uh, Ishvara and then uh, and uh, 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 the Chit or, or consciousness, how they all are 
in, in essence, the nature of Bhairava or Shiva um, in, in various forms. And it's a very, it's a beautiful uh, 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 system of philosophy. It's, it's not what people think about Tantra today, which is like sex and drugs and this, you know, it's not that at all. This is a very beautiful uh, engagement with um, um, the Tantric sources and Vedic sources. Um, and then on top of that, he finally also um, composed, uh, uh, I said, what is it else? What else did he compose? Yeah. And, and a lot of like uh, a lot of devotional hymns. Um, um, he, he was just a, a, an amazing individual whose whose repercussions, or well, not repercussions, whose legacy still existed today in in schools of Kashmir, right? And, and Kashmir Shaivism is uh, owes so much to Avinav Gupta and his tradition. And you know there was people before him, uh, you know that you know he learned from, and then people after him that have continued the tradition. Um, you know, and, and, and he, you know, he's amazing. There's also another person uh, who's at the tail end of this. A lot of this actually is very interesting. Is a, a, a lot of Kashmiris uh, or, or Kashmiri individuals. There's also, you know, Kshemendra, uh, who is a, a satirist, and um, he writes brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, satires. In uh, basically, just attacking, he just attacks everyone around him in in, in, in an amazing way. Um, and uh, I have to, I can go look up his, uh, his tax that he's written. Uh, uh, that, yes, yes, you're right. Yes, Brihat Katha Manjari. He also has like, you know, Ramayana Manjari, Bharata Manjari, um, and a, a bunch of other ones. Um, yeah, and and he was, he was interesting for that time period because um, in that time, which is, you know, around 900 or 1000 CE, um, Kashmir was, strongly Shaiva and Buddhist. Um, and he was a staunch Vaishnavite who started off as a Shaivite and kind of uh, uh, went after Buddhism and Shaivism uh, strongly. So yeah, and, and there's definitely some sectarian elements that, that exist all through this time period, but it is probably one of the, the, the greatest periods of intellectual development in one of the periods, one of the greatest periods um, in, in uh, Indian history. And those are just a couple of the, uh, uh, of the individuals that I bring up. And you can also, we can also talk about like Bhaskara um, or, uh, you know, there's Vedanta schools that come up there uh, and the Buddhist, you know, uh, Alanka or, um, you know, uh, you know, this is all, we have to remember, this is the period of time where, where um, the, the Chinese were coming to India and they were gathering so much information uh, about Buddhism and taking it back. And, and Indians from India, including Kashmir and other places, were traveling to China to give information, to give knowledge and um, and 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 the, and the logic of Buddhist thought. And some of that they brought in, uh, you know, Hindu thought with there, right? Um, yeah. And, and if people are very interested, uh, I, I mentioned I mentioned earlier. Um, this uh, skeptic by the name J. Rashi Bhatta, um, who was uh, who was who basically went after every single uh, existent school at that time, um, whether it's Buddhist, Jain, Hindu, uh, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, everything, and he wrote this text called uh, um, Tatva uh, Tatva Papa Papalava Simha Tatva Papala Simha. And it's um, it's basically, it, it. I mean, the meaning is great. It, it it means the 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 lion who roars at all the philosophies, and uproots all the philosophies. Yeah. So it's uh, right. it, it's a text that people should read. Right. So what we'll do is, as part of episode notes, we'll give links to all these texts, and um, hopefully, listeners and anybody who finds it interesting can read a little more and leave comments. And then Mukunda, you should engage with those comments. Oh yeah, I mean, if you, if people want to message me on on uh, what's it called Twitter about it, I'll definitely respond. We'll do that. We'll do that. Jay, uh, what have you read about the philosopher, those philosophers of this age, and uh, your thoughts? Uh, I think one scholar which I would like to talk about is a Jain scholar who comes from Gujarat. Uh, so he belongs to Hemachandra. Uh, yes, uh, Hemachandra Suri. Yes, yes, Mukunda. Uh, so. Hemchandra uh, Suri, I think his 
one of the brilliant uh, scholars or philosophers uh, saints of jaina tradition who uh, who uh, who has you know uh, ever existed because uh, there is this interesting title which uh, uh, he is known uh, he is known also as a as kali kal sarvagnya meaning the knower of all knowledge in his times so he produced works on uh, history on religion on sanskrit grammar on lexicon and uh, there is this interesting story that uh, not story there is also some uh, historical truth to this story that uh, he uh, he you know uh, brought uh, the chalukya ruler kumarpal to the jain fold so earlier he uh, this uh, kumarpal was a uh, shaiv uh, ruler but later under the influence of hemchandra Uh, he became a jain so hem hemchandra suri is one of the most important uh, jain uh, saints that ever existed and another point about kashmir is that kashmir also interestingly during this period becomes a center of historical scholarship so to say for example you know the work uh, mahakavya tradition particularly finds uh, a strong root in kashmir so we have works like uh, Vikra, uh, vikramanka dev charita and rajtarangani is uh, is the most famous text but there are also prithviraj vijay so the authors of these texts were kashmiri uh, brahmins so interestingly uh, there is this interesting thing that is going on in kashmir where we find that historical mahaka uh, mahakavyas as a tradition is you know uh, kashmir became an important center and broadly we when we talk about the mahakavya particularly historical mahakavyas it is during this period we have multiple examples of historical mahakavyas being authored so the start which we can say happened with bana's harsh charitra and after that we have navasa navasaha sank charitra and vikram uh, vikramank dev charitra then we have raj tarangani then the famous prithviraj vijay which uh, which is not a complete text about uh, prithviraj chauhan and then uh, there are other important text so uh, historically the mahakavya tradition also has roots during this period right right uh, uh, this was wonderful moving on uh, what is the role of temples in the society uh, Mukunda, uh, would you like to take that? Or Jay, what role do the uh, temples play in the society in terms of uh, social cohesion, in terms of expression of political power, in terms of religiosity? What roles do the temples play in North India at this I, time? I think this is the period where we see that you know massive temple building exercises were carried out throughout India, not just northern India, but also in uh, in southern India as well. and uh, there are multiple uh, functions if we have to call it that that uh, temples uh, you know became an important center of uh, religious life of a particular city let's say then what other important thing that happened is that there is this uh, which some scholars have called the puranic uh, the spread of puranic hinduism through out uh, india or let's say if we are talking about northern india particularly so there are uh, what happened is that with the construction of a particular temple the local uh, or folk deities of a particular region is assimilated into the broader puranic uh, puranic fold so for example uh, we have the famous example of uh, lord jagannath so lord jagannath uh, and the temple uh, uh, associated with this uh, uh, the uh, the temple was built during the early medieval period and jagannath uh, the worship of lord jagannath became a uh, you know central uh, role played a central role in the whole odisha uh, region so what we are seeing here is that uh, the local tradition is uh, uh, is getting merged into a broader let's say a pan indian uh, puranic tradition so this uh, this merger and how this merger happened was mainly through uh, temples 
and another important point about the temples is that the temples also became a center for let's say the the royal uh, a, a sort of a legitimacy for example the uh, famous temples at khajuraho were an important were important temples in terms of they portrayed the magnificence of the chandela rulers so in that way we can also see that you know the importance of temple building exercises that were carried out throughout india by different rulers this was mainly the results of it if i can so also it wasn't just rulers right so you have a lot of the the wealthy merchant community and you know even and and i think from what i've read and i could be wrong even even wealthy shudra communities used to contribute a lot of money to build temples or services or so on and so forth right um because at this time what you started having is there was a, a quite a bit of wealth generation going on um in, in in india at this time um and you you also see this some of this is is captured in the dharma shastra literature that was also being finalized in this time period right so the dharma shastra literature talks heavily about about things like you know the the merchant guilds that uh that were existent and and how business practices should be conducted in that time and also the, the relationship um to to the temples um and like i said earlier the agamic literature um was really being refined and finalized in this time period so the the manuals on temple construction and um the uh you know prana pratishta the murti and festivals and the, the you know the way temples were run was all presented within these texts whether it's going to be like you know um padma samhita or or, or jay kind samhita or a bunch of other you know panchartha texts that i look i know the panchartha i don't know so much about the the non panchartha stuff so but yes uh it, it, this time period you you see this huge development of the temple um practices and this comes from the tantric view that the vedic yajna um, is going to be uh, emulated or uh, refashioned in the temple. So then it becomes this experience between uh, the the temple deity and the 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 worshiper coming and kind of building this relational ecosystem that was very similar to how the Vedic yajnas used to be done. Right. Uh, right. I think uh, I will add uh, one important point uh, about temple particularly. So uh, what we see is that temple also became a uh, the term which is used by some scholars, which could sound a not politically correct, but uh, detribalization is the term which is used. But uh, that uh, particularly we are talking about the uh, the region of let's say eastern Bengal. So here, uh, you know the. the tribal practices are going on so what we see here is that the rulers of this region are uh, so we have uh, you know uh, grants from uh, from this period so let's say the 8th uh, 10th or 12th century ad so what we see is that the ruler of this region so komila silhet eastern uh, eastern uh, bangladesh so this region the ruler is a buddhist and he describes himself uh, as a buddhist but what we see is that he is giving grants to brahmanas to settle in this region and uh, uh, he is also building a temple so this interesting uh, uh, that uh, you know relation between these two traditions and how temple construction and the migration of brahmanas to a particular region so this is also the period of we have already talked about in the earlier podcast uh, about the migration of brahmanas so temple building uh, coupled with the migration of brahmanas also uh, 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 played an important role in the if we call it detribalization of certain regions and uh, this uh, like if we compare it to let's say Uh, uh, the, the example would be to compare it to the satvahana period so in the satvahana period what we see is that the uh, satvahana king kings describe themselves as uh, as ek brahmana uh, unique brahmana but what uh, what we seeing uh, what we see there is that uh, to for uh, uh, for the detribalization it is the uh, 
uh, Buddhist uh, like maha viharas that are being set up. But by this time, the situation is completely reversed. So the ruler is a uh, proclaims himself as a great Buddhist patron or great Buddhist wor wor worshiper. But uh, the but the uh, uh, but for detribalization or uh, the it is the temples that are being constructed, not the viharas. So I think that is an important point which I want to. Right, right. What about art forms, uh, performing arts, painting, sculptures? Is there anything that sort of what kind of evolution these uh, art forms saw, and what is it that we know this era for in terms of sculptures, in terms of yeah, arts, I mean. Painting? I would say, so obviously the temple uh, is um, one of the areas that you see uh, the sculptures come into fruition and uh, developed. Um, and, you know, dramas, you know, as we see, they were <clears throat> being written roughly a little before this time period, whether it's Maha, uh, Maha, um, Maha uh, Kavyas or um, you know, either, you know, you know, Shudraka's, you know, uh, his plays and, uh, um, you know, Basa's plays, these were all done with the elements of, of the Natya Shastra. And then also when you had Abhinav Gupta comment on this Natya Shastra, the, he elaborates on the traditions in his day. Um, and roughly at the tail end of this, right, so I'm talking like the end of the 12th century, uh, end of the 12th century, beginning of the 13th, there was this amazing text uh, on music that really was codified. Um, it was called Sagita Ratnakara, uh, written by, I think, by Sarangadeva. I think that was his name. Um, and he, it was, it's basically a text that covers all the music theory and practice that was existent I think at that time um, when the in, 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 in India at that period, it was it was written by, again, and this is this was the height of Kashmir like intellectualness. This was written again by K Kashmiri. Um, and the text itself covers what we now know today as Hindustani and Carnatic music, right? So this period of time, they have he talks about ragas, dalas, um, musical structures and techniques. Um, you know, um, well, things like Swaras, Brigas, Shrutis, um, and, and different styles of, 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 of music, right? In, in terms of, you know, uh, some senses like this is where you start getting like, you know, uh, Padams and uh, what we know today as Padam or Javalis that started their, their origin here. Like the Carnatic musics today, which is much more Kriti based, is what it wasn't necessarily what they were talking about back then. Right, so the the music from back then is um, is is different, but it's or but it it's connected to the music today. Like there's been a development. Um, so the idea was the person who composed whatever music or whatever it was was also required in, the, in that time, uh, according to the you know. Um, uh, Sagi, uh, the Sagita Ratnakara text that they were also supposed to be extremely well well trained and performing uh, 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 trained performers. Um, so they should like if you're composing music, you also have to be able to sing it um, and also be able to understand like the relationship between the singer and the audience. Um, so because if you go back to the Rasa theory, right, the the, the person that performs um, whether it is a Nataka who is a, 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 you know, the, the actor or in, in the drama or music or, or dance, the artist must be able to do, they have to have a bhava, right? The, so th there's two things in, in, rasa th in the rasa theory is there's bhava and rasa. So bhava is what the artist is expressing in, in, in what they're doing in the music, dance, whatever. And the rasa is what the audience member is supposed to feel that it's it's the or the the baba is what the artist expresses the ba, rasa is what the uh, individual feels or experiences 
um, in, in that art. So it's in this time period, this really became um, much more um, understood in a, at least music did as a theoretical framework um, because uh, Natya Shastra itself wasn't really focused on music. It was focused really on the, the Natya or the, the drama itself. Um, so, so you do see this real development um, in, in music uh, in, in India at this time with, uh, you know, Sangeet uh, Ratnakara. You know, and their earlier works, I, I, you know, I haven't read them, but I know there's, this is not like a one-off. It's, it's part of a, a long tradition, like most things in India are, with uh, uh, variant different uh, branches that someone tries to compile and then kind of churn into um, a more universal uh, understanding. So yeah, so so this would be you know um, where where music really came in, right? Um, and 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 then I also think when when it comes to uh, like I said earlier, the the sculptures and the and the development of uh, of uh, of that uh, uh, of you know uh, not performance art, but what's what's that called? Um, the material art. Um, it came really really uh, prominent in this time with uh, mostly the temple sculptures, um, but you do find other sculptures uh, throughout India that aren't necessarily all temple this time period. If, if, Jay, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Right. Jay, your thoughts? Yes, uh, I think uh, about the temple aspect, because uh, uh, what is interesting about the uh, how temples were con constructed in India is that in most cases, sculptures were part of the temple uh, uh, per se. So there were, uh, and in, 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 and also the this is the same with the paintings as well like most of the paintings that were done in temple courtyards let's say does not survive so uh, so we have some earlier reference from let's say in in southern india but uh, in when we talk about uh, northern india there are no uh, uh, temple paintings that survive but sculptures uh, became an important or uh, there are much more ornate structures that are being constructed during this period. So for example, we have the, you know, uh, uh, palace sculptures, which are, uh, have great ornamentation. So uh, th this, and, but, uh, and interestingly also the regionalization of sculptures is also going on. So uh, there are distinct, uh, what can say, what we can say is that there is a distinct characteristics to a particular sculptures that are being done, let's say in Eastern India, compared to the sculptures that are being done in Western India. So this regionalization of sculptures is also going on during this period. And, and just on that point, you know, one of the things that, that we have to also acknowledge is we don't have too many texts on the art of of sculptures right because these were in this time period you know post guptas um you know the 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 prevalent uh, the prevailing idea right now is like the the the, the varna system and the jati system started to become more and more rigid and and um fixed in some sense uh but not entirely there's still some fluidity going on um but much of the sculpting work was not done by either the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, or the Vaishyas, uh, you know, generally. Most of the work is done by the Shudra community. And my guess, and, and, and this is just my, my, uh, uh, my thought is, because they weren't lit, uh, you know, they weren't, um, they weren't, what's it called? Uh, they didn't have uh, writing. Um, at that time amongst probably the communities, um, they weren't putting it down into a written format to be preserved. And my, my, my guess is it was passed down as a craft from parent to child for generations after that. And there was refining happening over and over again. Um, but maybe I'm wrong and there's some texts out there that, that do talk about this. Uh, interestingly, right. uh... Uh, I will uh, just uh, briefly mention that in when we talk about the temples, particularly temples from northwestern India, 
so the region of uh, indian subcontinent the region of pakistan so the hindu shahi temples for example uh, we have some uh, reference of you know some traces of uh, the uh, greco bactrian or greco gandharan art that has uh, survived up until the early medieval period so uh, so this is an in interesting aspect and also the uh, different hindu rulers of kashmir and the temples they were constructing was a you know uh, it also has elements from let's say the byzantine element to uh, to to the uh, also indian elements so this is also an inter interesting aspect that some of the traces of uh, greco bactrian or greco gandharan art has survived up until this period and this i think is mainly because of as mukunda has just said that most of the uh, artist uh, the art is transferred uh, from one generation to another in terms of craft there are no manuals so to say i mean there just to correct myself there are shilpa shastras but i haven't read them and i don't know how how detailed they are um so i you know i can't really speak to that but there are shastras called shilpa shastras that are kind of like a corollary to vastu shastras no i would right. I, i would say that uh, shastras as a general text are there but uh, uh, like mukunda if you if you want to correct me you can uh, are there regionally specific uh, shilpa shastra test for example are there any i'm not sure about i mean i i don't want to speculate i i i would i would say maybe um but you know some of this is is kind of um referred to in like the agamic literature again especially when it comes to install installing and 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 crafting um the 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 murti or ishta devata so i'm not sure but if i had to make a guess i would say i'm sure there are some local text on this i just don't know i think we we'll leave it to that uh moving on now this is also a time when the early islamic influence is not, islam is well and truly there in the subcontinent now so what is the interaction of these uh, multiple philosophical strands and the way the state is looking at religion the state is looking at patronizing art and philosophy to the early islamic influence Omar sahab your thoughts also on this if you've read anything as to how the early islamic uh, influence merged and clashed with what was there I, i had more of a question than an answer uh, for uh, our you know our erudite people mukunda and jay uh, when we when i know, what, all i know about this period is what some of the islamic writers wrote about india right i read al biruni's book translation of course and other people uh, historians who have written about this period from the delhi sultanate but i have never read indian accounts of the turko you know the turkic colonization of india uh, the early turkic colonization what is the indian response uh, that, that actually i wanted to throw in this question in addition to what manish asked uh, is there a specifically an example of an indian writer writing about the arrival of the turkic colonizers what was their response jay go, you go ahead uh so uh, umar sahab uh, we have uh, like uh, there's this article by aziz ahmed about uh, about he compares the depiction of uh, uh, these two uh, people and how they depicted each other so he writes that there is this uh, particularly when we talk to talk about uh, the response from the in indian uh, side is that uh, or hindu side is that uh, the the response was basically a uh, literary uh, not not a literary but a popular response meaning that uh, what we see is that most of these works does not focus on learning or Uh, criticizing the let's say islamic uh, world view or islamic philosophies so for example the one of the earliest works that uh, we have that talks about uh, the the invasions is a text called uh, prithviraj vijay so prithviraj vijay is uh, is about uh, 
a victory of Prithviraj Chauhan. So we do not have the complete text. So we do not know which victory uh, this text is talking about. But most scholars speculate that this was most likely the first uh, uh, first victory at Tarayan that happened. So and uh, in this text, the interesting thing is that uh, there are some uh, important uh, uh, what you can say uh, essential. Uh, uh, the way they uh, these texts de describes uh, the Turks is quite interesting. So Gauri is is uh, Sanskritized. Uh, the name Gauri is Sanskritized as Go Ari. So Go in Sanskrit is cow. Ari is enemy. So enemy of the cows is uh, he. The Gauri is described as that. And then what we we also at the start of the text. So I have the Hindi translation of this text. So at the start of the text, what we see is that uh, the the poet is describing that the region of uh, of uh, uh, which is the famous lake in Rajasthan, uh, important uh, religious lake, Pushkar. Sorry. Yeah, Pushkar. So, it's a lake to Brahma. So, yes. Uh, so Pushkar, we are told that uh, the Malichcha army. So Malich is the term which is used for uh, not. Uh, there are also other terms, but. Here it is the term Malich, which is you, uh, which is being, being used. So what uh, uh, what the poet is telling us is that the Malichas are uh, you know polluting the sacred pond of Pushkar, and they are defiling it by bathing in it. So and the, then the uh, this the text also describes a uh, the messenger of or, or the messenger from Gauri. That has uh, arrived in the court of Prithviraj uh, Chauhan, and interestingly, the Ghaznavid, the later Ghaznavid rulers who now controlled the region of, let's say, uh, the Punjab region, uh, he uh, he is de described as the Lord of uh, Horses, Ashwapati. So uh, there are uh, uh, in, uh, interesting uh, the way these uh, Muslim or the Turks are described. And then we have also inscriptions from the 7th and 8th century. So this is uh, the period when uh, the Arabs were invading. And here what we see is that uh, most of the time the term Tajik is used uh, for, the, uh, for the Arabs. Uh, so I think uh, this is the important point. Right. And how are the various philosophical uh, schools, uh, schools of philosophy? How is the population? How are the kings reacting to a very different culture that is now coming to the subcontinent? Yeah, I mean, I don't think this time period, uh, I think more of the reactions happen around the 13th century, 14th century. Um, the early reactions, I don't think, at least I haven't read too much on them. Like, for example, like, you know, when the Delhi Sultanate uh, sacked Sri Rangam in like 13, 10, 13, 11, something like that. Um, there's there's incidences uh, that, you know, is captured within um, a particular religion, uh, no, the religious tradition I belong to, the Sri Vaishnavites. We we have that information or that, that event captured in our stories and in our um uh, you know, hagiographies of, you know, the, the great people within the tradition. Now, I imagine the same things happen up in the north with, uh, uh, ha you know, ha hagiographies of, you know, um, the the various uh, religious leaders or rulers at that time. But I just don't know much about it. Uh, I don't think there was much until probably the 13th or end of the 12th century. Right. Anything you've read over, Saab? on the early interaction between, uh, and especially since Mukunda has been, and we've been talking about the influence of uh, Kashmir on the overall uh, philosophy and uh, religious yeah, no, modes of the subcontinent at this time. No, I have the very typical sort of uh, uninformed response to this that I have only read what is from the Muslim side of it. Uh, you know, th those people were writing books those books have been preserved. Those books are very famous, Al-Biruni, Farishta, whatever. Uh, but we don't have equally famous, at least, accounts from the Indian side. Uh, if they exist, they don't seem to be well known. And uh, I think someone like Jai Vardhan <laughs> should really dig them up and put them out there. Yeah, Jay, it's about time you did something like that. <laughs> It'll make for your good PhD thesis also, right? Uh, yes. Uh, I think... Uh... <laughs> 
when we talk about the i, I mean rajat tarangani does refer to it um but uh the initial yes. muslim in, uh, influence uh, yes. but i haven't read rajat tarangani so i don't i don't have much to add uh, yes uh, in rajat tarangani there is this term which is used as mausal so mausal most likely is the term for musliman and uh, there are some interesting points that are uh, ascribed to uh, these mausalas so we are told that they are beef eaters and in this uh, interesting aspect is that in whether we are talking about uh, prithviraj vijay and then there are texts from let's say the 4th 14th and 15th century so prabandh chintamani is a text that was composed in the gujarat region and it talks about although it is composed in the 14th century but it also describes the period of uh, the early period also so we have uh, some traces of all uh, because uh, there are no exact details but there are some uh, vague references to the early invasions that for example the sack of vallabhi so vallabhi was sacked most likely around the 18th century by uh, an arab army so here what we see is that there is this interesting allegory which is uh, which is present in this text so what we are told that when the malecha army has surrounded the city of vallabhi so what happens is now is that most of the idols of the temple what they of the different temples of the city of vallabhi what they do is that they start flying to different regions and uh, the uh, the 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 patron deity of the city of vallabhi we are told is crying and uh, he is uh, he is telling us uh, telling the one of his listeners is that uh, one of her listeners is that uh, the the waters will now turn bl- turn into blood so this is an interesting allegory that is that is present in prabandh chintamani but the aspect of uh, bee feeding particularly is common to let's say uh, like more the, the three or four uh, in uh, text which i have referred up until now these are common and then also the desecration or destruction of temple aspect that is present throughout the uh, these uh, three or four texts so in these two ways uh, we can say that uh, there is this uh, association with the turks or the arabs but this is not uh, to say that there was no uh, there was there was not a complex relationship because what we find is that we have reference that a a most likely an arab was uh, was given the uh, uh, given a particular province to rule by the rashtrakuta ruler so uh, the situation is, is is not as straightforward as we would like it to be so this point sure so to wrap up the episode uh... what is the legacy of this age what are some of the philosophical schools religious practices art forms cultural motives that survive till this age uh, mukunda would you like to take that first okay can you ask that again sorry you know i was asking uh, what are some of the what is the legacy of this age what are some of the philosophical schools cultural yeah. traditions i mean we touched upon that earlier but all these schools whether you talk about mamamsa or nyaya um and you know to a lesser extent like samkhya in this time period um eventually curtailed into uh vedanta right so a lot of the um the like for works of like the like kumara labhata or baskara or i mean prabhakara uh, or jayanta bhatta or all these people during this time period their works started to be used like their ideas were used in say uh shankara's bhasha you know he was writing in response partially to kumarila uh, you know you know kumarila and then you had ramanuja who who adopted quite a bit of prabhakara's uh, mimamsa theory or responded to you know various nyaya theories you know vedanta has a different perspective on for example nyaya um thinks that logic is a method to prove god um whereas the vedantins do not uh they only accept for example shabda pramana or the legitimacy of texts of the shastras to tell you the nature of god where nyaya doesn't take that perspective um and so a lot of these different schools started their legacies kind of got curtailed and brought into the vedanta tradition and then um stemming from this time period i think this is when you also start seeing um 
and I and, and my in my guess is it, it was also during this time period, like I said earlier, there was some ossification and um uh stages of oppression with with the Varna Jati system that the Bhakti that the Bhakti movement was started roughly at the tail end of this, um, started to change, right? Like if you look at I know, I know this is more North India, but for example, the Bhakti movement in South India started roughly around, you know, we can say seventh to eighth century CE um, with the uh, Alvars and uh, Nayanars. Um, and in the North, you had similar movements um, that started to happen with the Nat Sampradaya. Um, and then you had, you know, from the Nat Sampradaya in the 16th century or 15th century, you had think, people like Nyane uh, who came about. So, um, and then from, you know, like from the South came up, you know, uh, uh, roughly at the tail end of this period again, the the Ramananda uh, Sampradaya, which you know uh, uh, claims its origin from Ramananda Sampradaya, the Ramananda Sampradaya started uh, influencing people like Eknath, Mirabai. Uh, so you had this really big uh, development that connects from uh, the north to south and back to the north. Um, and I think this is a really is very fertile time period in the North Indian, generally Indian landscape. Um, and uh, there's a lot of ideas, thoughts, um, and, 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 and you know, even like I'm saying, like even with the, the Sagita and Afnakara, all Hindustani and Carnatic music today, to this day, had owes some, um, some of its foundations to that text. So, it, it's. I just. I. I don't think this period of time in Indian history can be uh, overstated in, in intellectual development. And I'm not even talking about things like, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, after you know Aryabhatta, you had you know, Varar, you know, Varar and Mira and the science. And so I don't know much about the science stuff, but I know that there was science done because we had, you know, the you know the the Iron Pillar in Delhi. You know, was created roughly at the 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 early period in this in this age, right? What we're talking about, where they had the the skills and knowledge of um, you know metallurgy to create a pillar that basically wouldn't rust um, for you know thousand plus years. So there were some. There's a lot of things going on um, that clearly have deep impacts even to India today. Right, Jay. Your thoughts? Final thoughts? Yes, I think uh, the early medieval period is an important period, like most of the ritualistic practices, like Mukundaji has talked about the fact that most of the Puranas were, uh, you know, uh, took, uh, took their final form during this period. And uh, because of this, and the fact that, you know, most of the temples, major temples were constructed during this period. So as a Puranic Hinduism or the Hinduism which we practice today, most of the practices that has come down to us to this day uh, have their roots in this period. Whether we are talking about the ritualistic aside or aspect, or whether we are talking about, let's say, how a particular uh, god is uh, or uh, deity is depicted. So the, whether uh, in terms of sculpture details, or whether we are talking about how a particular ritual, uh, like uh, uh, Puranic ritual, mostly uh, were done so in most cases it is the early medieval period which we can say which we can more relate to because the uh, the traditions or the practices that had uh, that had roots in the let's say the gupta period they matured in this period in the early medieval period and uh, it would be it, it it would not be wrong to say that after the early medieval period so the early in the medieval period particularly there is not much evolution that happened strictly if we, take, if we are talking about the Northern India, especially. So I think uh, Mukunda, uh, Mukunda uh, uh, am, am I right about saying this? Um, saying, can, can you rephrase it? So I understand like, the problem. Uh, the evolution of, let's say, the practice, Puranic or Hindu practices, particularly in Northern India, there is not much evolution which we see uh, from the medieval period to the modern period. No, I mean there definitely is. There's uh, there's a lot. There's a lot because a lot happens 
from you know the time of say 1300s to to modern times right so in this time period is when like for example Vaishnavism is practiced across all of India today it was developed in that time period whether it's Dwaita or Vishisha Dwaita um, Chinta Beda Beda or you know uh, Beda Beda of Nibanka or whatever we're all developed roughly around this tail end of this period or even you know Nimbaka might be earlier but you know there's a lot of discrepancy on that one um but I would say there's so what we end up having is some of the origins like for example um even if you look at uh Kashmir Shaivism right even though the foundational texts are done by Abhinav Gupta at you know you know 10th 11th century it got fully formed in probably 13 14 15th century and then you have various other traditions that arose in that time. The Puranas, you know, they we go to the Puranas for stories and then some mantras, but the practices actually, I would say, were much more agamic, right? In the sense of the temple, temple worship is a very agamic uh, a tradition, uh, agamic tantric tradition that has been, you know, expanded in the past, you know, a thousand years or so. Um, and and there's been a lot of developments and practices. Um, but yes, I would say the origins of that, a lot of these practices started in in this period of time. And again, I guess the term medieval is weird because medieval is, is such a European sense um, because India really didn't go through what Europe went through in that time period, right? Which is that quote unquote dark ages, even though there's a lot of discussion on what that meant. Um, in, India didn't have that uh, intellectual uh, vacuum that occurred after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. Um, in, until the time of, you know, 12th, uh, 13th century, when after the Islamic uh, uh, golden age and brought back Plato, Aristotle and all that. Um, so I do think India... Ukunna, Ukunna, I think, yeah, I think that's a very interesting and a very contentious point. And I think we'll take that up in the upcoming episodes. As yeah, to yeah, how that's fine. India, whether it actually saw dark ages, what was the evolution and how did Indian society evolve in the, you know post what we, what Jay would call the early medieval age, but that's a discussion for another episode. I would like to remind our listeners that as part of our episode notes, our speakers will provide links and we'll post links of all the reference material they've used as part of this conversation. And Mukunda, we'll need links for all the scriptures and all the works that you've spoken oh, man, about. There's so much more and work. Obviously, okay, we'll put fine. out your Twitter handle so that our listeners can directly engage with you. Okay, I mean- Omar Saab, any final- Omar, any, Omar Sahib, any final thoughts from you? Any final thoughts from our speakers? Uh, I just wanted to say there's uh, one thing about which I don't know enough to comment, but uh, Amir Khusro uh, is also in this period who is sort of a figure in Indo-Islamic synthesis, you know, this whole business of how much did the Islamic colonizers pick up from India and how much did they give to India? And one of the star figures in that is Amir Khusro. Uh, I know no, not enough about him to say any more, but... Uh, Maybe uh, in some of the links or something, we can mention something about it. And also we'll cover Amir Khusro and uh, his works and legacy in the upcoming episodes when you take up the episode right, on the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi Sultanate. Yeah. Right. right. This was wonderful. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Omar Saab. Thank you, Mukunda. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you on the upcoming episodes again. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys.